All right, guess we'll get started here. Um, thank you all for coming. Before we start, though, I just want to talk a little bit about us. Uh, we're TIVA, which stands for Tsinghua International Blockchain Association, and host live events and such like that to raise the awareness of blockchain and for people to learn about this technology. And this semester, we started doing this intro to blockchain course. And previously, we could talk about the history of blockchain, cryptography, and distributed systems. We talk about Bitcoin and Ethereum. We talk about blockchain applications, as well as some enterprise blockchain. And today, which is actually our, our last lecture of the series, Brian, our own TIBA member, who is a CS major at Tsinghua, and will be a senior after the summer, he'll talk about some of the limitations and vulnerabilities of blockchain technology. So, Brian, all yours. All right. Thank you, Samuel, for the introduction. Let me just set up my screen. One second. All right. Can you guys all see the keynotes? Oh, this Apple thing. Yeah, you can see it. All right, all right cool, cool. All right, uh, I think I'm in a keynote mode, so I can't really see any comments or anything. So. If any of you have any questions during my uh, lecture, just turn on the microphone and then just speak out loud and then I'll explain, all right? So, well, I guess I'll first start with my introduction. Uh, my name is Jin Wu Seong, or you guys can just call me Brian. Uh, I'm greeting you guys here in South Korea. Nice to meet you all here. And I'll be covering the topics of limitations and vulnerability of blockchain today with to you guys. Well, let's try to keep, make it within 30 minutes. Don't want to take up too much of your time. So how I divided them. When it comes to limitation, I divided them into four categories. There's tech, there's society, there's environment, reality. Tech because it's own nature. And what is wrong with blockchain? And then how and how this mistake is affecting the society that we live in today. And how is this situation going to affect the environment that our society is located in? And after all this, we're going to think about, like, do we really need this technology? And after that, I'll be covering the vulnerability, like how you, how you can kill a blockchain. All right, let's start with the tech. Tech, obviously, it starts with the scalability problem. Uh, compared to the centralized applications like we have the, uh, nowadays, where you have a point blue and then point green here, in a centralized server, you just have to, in a centralized situation, uh, if you want to send data from blue to green, then you just have to send the data to the server, and the server just have to send it, redirect it to the green. And that's it. It's only two, it's only two steps here. But in a decentralized manner, uh, if you're lucky, then you, you can probably do the same thing. But what if you have a point black over there that you want to send data to? That means you have to do from this to that, to there, to here, and there. That's like almost one, two, three, four, five, which is three more steps to go. It is quite inefficient compared to the centralized. It is a limitation compared to the centralized uh, approach. Because of that, uh, we can tell that Bitcoin is pretty slow when it comes to transaction per second, uh, which is mentioned in the previous lecture uh, by Sam. So Visa, in this case, uh, they claim to have 24,000 transactions per second. But from my research result, it is only 1,700. It's a theoretical, 24,000 is, is only a, it's only a theoretical number, but 1,700 is like the legit one. But still, it is faster than Ripple or just any other Bitcoin, or I, I mean, blockchain platforms out there. And change of protocol, which means like upgrading the software. Software. So how can I upgrade the software? I can do it via soft fork and the hard fork. So what is soft fork? Uh, this is a lot of English over here. A soft fork is like changing a cryptocurrency protocol, which is backward compatible, like. I don't even know what it means, but what it means is, I'll explain it here. Uh, let's say my previous version is version 0 0.1. And then I'm just, uh, I, I've been using it for like two blocks now. 
And after two blocks, I decided to upgrade it, upgrade it to zero, uh, version 0 0.2. So in this case, uh, I, I, can, uh, I decided to upgrade, but I also decided not to abandon the previous ones, uh, the previous versions. So, so the main chain will following the uh, version 0 0.2 chains. So if you can see the bottom four blocks, which is a V0.2, that's the, the newer version of the block, of the chain. And then the main chain will follow that chain. But the uh, version 0 0.1 won't be abandoned because as long as the version 0 0.1 uh, blocks are generating and uh, and is generating and then is applying or or let's say it doesn't go against the new rules then it can survive only until it actually goes against the rule then the main chain will say you should stop you know you're, you're not qualified anymore uh, we don't want you anymore then that's when the uh, when the uh, when the older chain is stopped so so it has some space for it you know it it won't die after upgrades it will still survive, but only until you make some mistake, and then you will die. That's the soft fork. And a hard fork, hard fork is basically uh, a more robust way to upgrade the chain, which means once you upgrade it, uh, you know, the older versions of the chain won't be compatible. It will be incompatible with the, the newer one. And if we understand it in via graph, a graphical way, that means you, uh, our original chain was coin X. And then it was operating well and doing uh, doing okay, but one day this the developers decided to upgrade it, and because uh, because somebody has different opinions about it, let's say, oh, I I want I want shares to be all available to every single person, and then somebody will say, oh no, I don't want shares to be available to everybody. I just want shares to be available to somebody. This is two different opinions. So because these two opinions are too strong. They decided to have their own, their own versions of the change. That is where hard fork comes uh, comes to play. Uh, so after the fork means coin X and coin Y, they will both uh, they will both uh, how do you say sustain? Like they won't die out as long as the developers, as long as there are miners maintaining the chain. Uh, but they do share the same history. So. It is weird, you know. This uh, this is this means like every time you do a hard fork, you know, your change will split into two different chains that operates uh, that both operates well. You know, there there's nothing that it, that will kill them unless you do something wrong. So one famous uh, blockchain hard fork example will be uh, the Bitcoin Cash. Now the Bitcoin Cash is uh, generate uh, is created because there's somebody. Uh, who discovered that in Bitcoin there is something uh, that there's something called signature data and then it's quite useless in most cases so they they don't want it to be on the main chain so with the technology of SegWit which they created Bitcoin Cash uh, well SegWit is something that off the topic but it's a side chain side chain solution that can Kind of move all the signature data off the main chain to the side chain, so that you know the main chain has is smaller in data size, and then it's just faster, it's more efficient. It's basically helping the Bitcoin network to to transact faster. But somebody don't agree. They say you know Bitcoin should be just Bitcoin. Nobody should just do anything about it. So Bitcoin remain. So that's why this is a famous. Uh, this is a very famous hard uh, hard fork case that happened. And then Bitcoin Cash is quite famous of a coin itself as well. So feel free to check it out. And I I put a link here so you can just click click on it after I post this PowerPoint to the group chat. So all right. And last thing about the tech limitation will be the interoperability. So interoperability is. It's like the communications between blockchains. Uh, let's say you have Bitcoin chain and then you have Ethereum chain, but they cannot communicate with each other. The reason is because they have different protocols. They have different coding languages, which Bitcoin is like C or C++. I can't remember exactly, but uh, Ethereum is Go language, which is completely different. And then their consensus, uh, consensus mechanisms, uh, they are the same. There are uh, they are POW, I think, for now. But like 
for Ethereum 2.0 is POS, which is completely different. And some of their privacy measures might be different as well. So because of that, you know, they can't just communicate with each other. There's nothing, there's not, not a universal standard for them to communicate with each other. Unlike our date and daily internet, we have uh we have IP address, uh, you know, you know, we have like internet address www.something.com. That's like a standard that people follow and then people people can just use. And that's why we have a tool called browser that can just follow that standard and then for us to access the websites. But there's somebody trying to do uh, trying to change this situation, which is Polkadot. We hosted one we hosted one of the events with them and it was quite successful. Uh, so what they're trying to do is basically uh, creating the fundamental layer and then uh, letting blockchain platforms to develop on their platform. Uh, that's how I understood it. I didn't took a very deep look, but feel free to check it out. So that's it for the technology part. And then now we'll start with the society. Society will be more closer to our day-to-day -day, day -day life. And then there are three topics. I'll start with the regulations. Uh, there are a lot of countries have different approaches about blockchain being in their country. Let's say Estonia. Uh, I, I think that country is called Estonia. So that country basically tried to implement blockchain into their government system, their citizenship, like how they man manage their citizens. It's like they're trying to make their country a blockchain country. That's one case. But on the other hand, we also have China, which China, what what he's uh, what they're trying is, see, in two thousand thirteen, they per prohibited the Bitcoin transactions. In two thousand fourteen, uh, they tried to shut down the Bitcoin trading accounts in commercial banks and payment companies. So they're completely against the Bitcoin uh, being exist in China legally. And in on in two thousand seventeen September, uh, they also shut down. Uh, wait. Yeah, I I think they also shut down like I, I ICOs uh in China. So after that, you know, the the ICOs were not legal in China. ICO is basically uh, initial coin offering is basically something very similar to our IPO nowadays, which is uh you have crowdfunding and then people can pay the money. Uh, they will buy the coins via paying the money. So it's like coins will be your share. That's how you understand the ICO. And in 2018, they just shut down a lot of companies, a lot of trading platforms, exchanges. But that didn't last long. But on in 2019, they decided to change their approach to uh, change their attitude to blockchain, which they kind of set out uh, regulations that you can follow uh, so that you can just legally operate in China. And also we have an inefficiency here. So inefficiency means, uh, you, you know, blockchain is all about consensus. How do you achieve consensus? Because everybody has to share the same piece of evidence so that people can prove that one data is right. Because majority has the same data to prove that one person with the fault data is fault. But that also means that you have to keep the complete records of the data. So at this point for Bitcoin ledger is 269 gigabytes, which is really, really big. And cost of implementation, uh, this is just like learning curve as you guys are all learning in this lecture. It took me really long to learn as well. I'm sure it took you guys a lot of work to learn. <laughs> But the resources are just all over. And then also for companies to host a blockchain solution, it takes quite some money to maintain the technology. And the time consumption of implementing or just developing blockchain itself, well, is be, uh, first of all, blockchain developer, there are not much blockchain developers out there. And then also it takes really long to actually implement a blockchain or just develop a blockchain, just like ETH 2.0. It says it's going to come out this year, but it's still not yet. And financial aspect wise, uh, yeah, it costs a lot. There's really not much to explain. This it's a future technology. There's not much uh, cheap solutions out there. You just have to, yeah, you, you just have to pay a lot of money to get what you want in blockchain. 
And that's it for the society wise. So how is that situation affecting our environment? So in Bitcoin, in blockchain, as we all know, there's something, there's a terminology called mining, like mining cryptocurrencies. So how do you mine it? Uh, but that's more specific to, okay. oh, all right. Okay. Sorry. Well, that's more specific to the to POW consensus. Well, let's see. Oh, sorry. Well, which means you have to just use your computer to keep on calculating, which if I make it more easier, just your CPU. You have to have your CPU running all the time. And the CPU takes a lot of energy. As a result, you know, and, and uh, as a result, mining Bitcoin alone uses the same amount of energy as used by entire island of Ireland in a single year, which is a, a huge amount. Uh, there's a chart for you guys to kind of just visualize it. Uh, Bitcoin's energy consumption compared to Israel and Greece is about its equivalent or even more than a country's cost. And then the amount of energy that consumed by Bitcoin can be uh, can be powered uh, eighty more than eighty five percent of Czech Republic's, and then almost three percent or two percent of United States, which is a lot. So it is calculating. Uh, it is calculating. It is wasting its power. And then, but at the end of the day, only one uh, only one node will get the the block that. It, uh, only one node will get the calculated result. So all the other calculated powers will be just wasted. Uh, so which is not good for our environment. And after all that, after all those limitations, let's talk about reality. Like, do we really need it? So let's talk about the big corps like we have today. Like they, there are some companies even using Windows 7s, Windows XP and their uh, in their manufacturer, uh, in, in their manufacturer stream uh, lines, or just some of their th those those parts where they don't have to have the most advanced technology, uh, but they just have to have it running all the time. Maybe blockchain with the implementation of blockchain might help them a little, but the fact is, it costs a lot to implement the blockchain itself, and then it's only helping them by a little. So there's really no point of using blockchain in the first place. And also lack of blockchain developers. If you want to implement blockchains, means you need to hire blockchain developers. But because they are such in high demand, means it takes a lot of money to actually hire them. That's first of all. And second of all is you just can't find them at the first place. And last is blockchain in some cases can be just slow and cumbersome. Uh, just like what I said before, like it takes the WeChat Pay, Alipay, it's a centralized server and then it does everything super, super fast. Like it takes, it, there's really no delay in transferring money via WeChat compared to BTC, if you want to do a transaction on BTC, it's 16 minutes. So that is the fact here. So that was limitations for you, uh, for today's. And then I'll be covering vulnerabilities from now on. So how can we actually kill a blockchain? Well, there's 51% attack, there's cyber attack, there's eclipse attack, there's blah, blah, blah attack. There's actually a lot of attacks that actually affect blockchain or just actually kill the blockchain itself. But today I'm just gonna cover, since it's for more for uh, beginners, uh, this course is more for beginners. So I'll be covering the these three over here. So I'll start with the 51% attack. Uh, if you want to know what 51% attack is, you should probably understand how blockchain works at the first place. If you follow along our course series, then you probably know it by now, but I'm sure there's somebody who doesn't know it yet. So I'll just simply, uh, I'll just cover it briefly. And I'll, I'll be talking about the POW consensus uh, more uh, individually. So. POW is something that is used in Bit, uh, in block in Bitcoin, and then is an original consensus algorithm in a blockchain network. It's used to confirm transactions and produce new blocks to the chain. 
and then it follows the rule of decisions will be made by the majority. So how, how, how can I understand this? Like, what if I am the majority? You know, what if I am everyone, <laughs> right? So this is a healthy network that I would say in a blockchain network. There are six nodes and then uh, this green color means like they're healthy, they're not being attacked, they're not being hacked, they're just good nodes, good operating nodes, and they're connected. But what if this node is being hacked or destroyed? Then the other five nodes can use their own ledger. As I said before, you know, in a in a blockchain network, everybody has a copy of the ledger. So they can use their own ledger to indicate that this node is actually a fault node. And therefore, this node will be erased from the network like this. And then this network will keep on operating uh, fully functionally. But what if this person here, this person here, he is very rich and very powerful, and he has the most computing power in the world. He owns the four nodes in this network, like four of these. Here. So which means in this case, he can make his nodes hits four nodes to tell the other two nodes uh, that those two nodes are actually, the correct nodes are actually the fault nodes. And then they can just, oh, I forgot the deleting, sorry then. <laughs> I forgot the deleting uh, animation, but basically these two green nodes will be eliminated and then the network will be only, uh, only containing the four red nodes that is owned by this guy. Right, so, which means he will own the entire network. That's like one of the scenarios of 51% attack. But the general idea of 51% attack is uh, someone or somebody, uh, so, someone or some organizations owns more than 50% of the network's mining hash rate or computing power. And because of that, you know, the network will be controllable is it won't be decentralized. Uh, it won't be decentralized. It is quite centralized because one person or group of person actually owns this. And then those group of persons are together, like they know each other. So that's 51% over here. And then we also have centralized mining, uh, which is also, uh, it's, it's like a use case or, or just like real life case of a 51% attack, or it might be. There's a company called Bitmain, which is, a Beijing-based company who designed ASIC chip uh, my, uh, mining machines for blockchain minings uh, is quite a big company indeed. And then, well, let me first explain what ASIC is. It's application-specific integrated circuits. So in this case, they they might produce uh, they will produce something called like Bitcoin mining uh, ASIC uh, machines. So Bitcoin will be this application that they are specifically integrated for. Uh, so that means they calculate faster than just normal CPU or other uh, uh, other GPUs. Uh, and the idea of the centralized mining is basically same, similar to 51% attack, but a person or a company owns a lot of hashing power that this, own, uh, this owner has a really high chance of mining the next block. So let's say this person or this company owns like 10% of the global hashing power. Then it is likely that with when every 10 blocks are mined, then there's one block that belongs to them that, that is mined by them. Sorry, this word is wrong. So whenever people mine a block, then they get they gets a reward. So that, that is how that is how they will earn the money. So that might cost 51% attack because this is only 10% that we're talking about here. But what if this 10% increase until more than 50% or just like 51, more than 51%? Uh, it won't be a very healthy situation for our network here. There's more info down there. And the last but not least, the DAO attack. Well, the DAO attack is a, is a fa very famous uh, case on Ethereum. Basically, in 2016, there is a smart contract called DAO, and it possibly be, possibly be one of the largest crowdfund ever on a smart contract. It was raised $120 million. A lot of, that's a lot of money. Now, everybody was really hyped about this and then saying, well, this is something 
probably about fintech and then there's a lot of things about this everybody was psyched but there was one night an attacker actually drained 70 million dollars from those crowdfund uh, only via a contract bug so what is smart contract in the first place i can't understand this news and what is dao how did he hack that first place? So let me explain this piece of news step by step. Start with the smart contract over here. Smart contract is basically just codes, but it is codes like it is it's a piece of uh, uh like a procedure going uh script. Let's put it this way. All right. It is code and it is just a script that runs on the machines, but it is a blockchain code which means once you upload it to the blockchains, it's immutable and it's perpetual. You know, you won't be able to change it unless you hard fork, soft forked it, or, uh, and then as long as there are machines running in this network, then it's perpetual. You know, there's nothing that can actually stop it. So that's smart contract over here. And what is DAO? Well, it's basically smart contract, but longer. Like probably a thousand times or a million times. I don't know how exactly how long that code is, but it is way more than this example code that I provided. Well, to be more specific, a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, in short, uh, in abbreviation, they will call themselves DAO, DAO. And the goal is to codify the rules and decision making uh, process so that you know people don't have to go through organ. Uh, the central uh, center authorities, they can just do a lot of contract things, all the all the communication things, or all the transferring things, uh, via uh, autonomously, so that they don't have to go through a centralized organization. And then those rules, the autonomous uh, how to how to autonomize the process, the rule is set by writing smart contracts. But let me be more specific about how DAO works. So a group of people will write about smart contracts and then those contracts will be running on the organizations. And via ICO, uh, P, uh, the, the, pro, uh, the organization will crowdfund, uh, will crowdfund uh, their, their operating money. And then which the more tokens you have, it doesn't mean that you have more uh, shares or more, let's say more, more money. Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not really. It's really not about money, but it's more about ownership. It's like the more money you put in, the more authority you have in this organization to speak and then to make decisions. And then after this funding period, the organization will start to operate, and then following the smart contract rules. And the people then can make proposals to the DAO on how to spend the money and the members who have bought in can vote to approve these approval uh, proposals. So it's more like a very non-government organization or just there's no head, no center organization. And then th this is what they're trying to do. But how does this organization fail? Well, if I want to explain it, maybe I can explain with an example here. Let's say you have a $50 in your account and then you're trying to withdraw from the ATM. All right. So you request it to withdraw $50. And after the ATM will, uh, the ATM after receiving the request, the ATM will check your balance. Like, do you have $50 in your account? Well, you actually do. Then it will actually split out the cash and the debit $50 from your account. An ATM will ask you if you want to have another transaction. Right? You could say yes in this case. And then you try to request to withdraw $50 again. But this time, you don't have sufficient fund. Uh, the, the ATM will check your balance and then tell you that you don't have sufficient fund. And it will re refuse your request. And then we'll come back here and then ask you again if you want to have another transaction. But this time, you know, there's no use of trying again because you won't get another $50. So you can just say, no, the operation is finished. That's like the normal procedure that we go through on our ATM machines nowadays. But what if the ATM only checked your balance when your first, uh, when your first request, in your first request, 
and don't check it after that. So what does it mean here? Well, let's just say we gone through all the procedure we had before. Like we already got, we requested the $50 the first time and then they check our balance and then we got our $50 and then ATM is asking you, do you want to have another transaction? All right now you have to make a decision. Is it yes or no? Let's just say yes. And then you try to request to withdraw $50 again from the ATM. But this time, ATM, it won't check your balance. It will just directly split out the cash and debit $50 and then give it to you. And you can just take the money. And then, they, and then it comes back to this loop again. And then this ATM will ask you another time saying, do you want another transaction? And then this is a dead loop. You can just keep on going and going, going until you, whenever you want to stop, when you click no over here. So what, uh, so basically, I'm oh, sorry. So basically DAO attack was, this is how DAO attack work because there's some flaw in the DAO code itself. Uh, it won't check uh, the balance of your, uh, balance in your account on, uh, the, every single time, but only the first time. So because of that, this DAO attack was possible and this hacker got a, a huge load of money. But be more specific about the DAO attack, it is an attack that was only possible because, not because of the problem with Ethereum, but the contract that was built on top of it. So it's the DAO's problem, not the Ethereum's problem. It's the smart application's problem. And the organization was not able to fix the problem in time because because it is a no-headed, like no-centered uh, organization, so they cannot make decisions as efficient as they can. So after the attacker have drew out a lot of money, they they wasn't they they noticed the problem, they but they just couldn't do anything because they have to vote for amendment or just change in the protocol. So I guess for now that's it for the limitations and the vulnerabilities. I've covered tech, society, uh, environmental, and realistic point of view uh, for the limitations and the vulnerability of blockchains. Hope you guys learned something. I mean, blockchain is still in an immature technology, but it is the bright side of it that brought us here all today in this lecture. Despite all the limitations and vulnerabilities that, that I mentioned before, there's still so much of blockchain potentials that we haven't discovered. So thank you all for listening. And then if you have any questions, please turn on your microphone and ask me directly. And I know my English isn't sufficient enough, but thank you all for bearing my bad English. Thank you. All right, um, let me just stop this screen sharing. Oh, <laughs> my friend is over here too. Cool. Uh, was there anything confusing? Feel free to ask. All right. Well, Sam, uh, since this is the very last lecture, do you want to make like a conclusion to the series? Hello? Well, I guess we'll have a blog, blog post or some sort of conclusion following up. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure I why. mean like a conclusion speech for this whole series. I you mean, did I, a great, I haven't did a great prepared work. anything, so it probably be in the blog or something. <laughs> cool, then. Cool. But yeah, thank you all, all right. for joining, though. Uh, Thank you all for joining, I guess. Yeah. I hope you guys liked it. Uh, uh, well, if there's no more questions, I guess that's it for our lecture today. Thank you all. See ya. Yep, see ya.